Welcome to Auto Off Topic. Are we still auto off topic, Andrew? We are still auto off topic. Okay, good. We did not rename it. All right, excellent. <laughs> we had a couple of comments based on the title of last week's episode, uh, which was a joke based on the Volkswagen joke that we talked about in the beginning of the episode. So if you missed that, we apologize. But we too are guilty of a bad April Fool's moment, I guess. Even though it wasn't really, it was taken that way. I think because we weren't thinking about the timing of it. Uh, I guess. I mean, it was kind of on purpose, but... It was on purpose, but the intent the intention wasn't to confuse. But we pulled it off by confusing people anyway. So we are still well, off topic from here, I mean, now, and forever. I can't help that you got duped by a couple of dummies with a podcast. So That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So everybody who called us out on it, remember that Andrew's the one who said that, nope, he said we're dummies. Never mind. Yeah. Damn it. We are dummies. Further, further point proven. Auto Off Topic Podcast, the podcast by dummies for dummies. Yeah. How to podcast <laughs> yes. for dummies. You need a microphone and a beer yeah. Yeah. and you're good to go. Uh, so what's new, Andrew? How's uh, how's life up in the uh, Northeast this week? Um, moving along on the G20. So I I think I talked about I ordered some stuff for it. I still haven't had a chance to clean the tone rings. I think all signs are kind of pointing as the tone rings that are dirty. Excellent. <clears throat> um, I got to pull up, pull off the rear caliper and rotor to do it. it shouldn't be a big deal because it's uh, – I like – earlier well i don't know when they were i kind of the town eclipses galanta like this where the and the, apparently g20 is too where the parking brake is in the caliber and not shoes inside of the hat which is super okay annoying when they yeah pull. that's i don't know if it's a year break thing or if it's just kind of like a they did what they did i don't know if there's any I've, I've seen cars newer and older have it both ways so yeah anyway it's not so it's not that bad to take them off so I got to do that, but, um, you know, I was up there looking at stuff and the, none of the struts had bump stops. Okay. Uh, I think the fronts like deteriorated and they fell out and the rears, it's got replacement auto part international struts. So clearly somebody didn't put them back in. Like there's right. no boot. There's no like bellows boot either. All right. With, and lack of bump stops means short lifespan for struts. Yeah. And it also rode kind of, hmm. Because yeah. I was wondering if it would like had the original struts on it, and I was like, oh, 100K, yeah, do struts at 100K. But apparently somebody did it, but not the right way. Um, so when I was probably 18 or 19, I had suspension installed in my car, and the mechanic who I paid money at the time to do it told me I did not need bump stops. And he, yeah. took them all, he took them all out. So I had no bump stops and lowered springs, and I can tell you that my struts didn't last 6,000 miles. <laughs> And you probably paid him like 400 bucks to put springs in. I couldn't tell you what I paid him, but you know what? I was young and dumb and mistakes were learned. Mistakes were made and knowledge was learned, right? It's yeah. the only way to do it. So unfortunately, there's like you either have to buy coilovers or the only option is KRB, KYB GR2s. Okay. Or there's a new... There's a new KYB, but it's in Japan only that I found looking on Japanese auction sites. It's like the it's like the KYB like GR Sport or something, and they're like light pink. They're like light uh, like a periwinkle blue. All right. I, I don't know if they're any different than a, a GR2. Maybe they're nicer. Maybe I mean, the, the GR2s aren't terrible. Terrible. They're they're last longer than the AGXs ever did. Well, they're. It doesn't. They're like just a basic yeah. uh, replacement shock, but technically, the original shocks in the car were KYBs. So okay, I'm just saying. I know of most Japanese stuff. You, you hear a lot of garbage about KYB GR2s, and I don't. You know, we're not making a race car. They're not going to be terrible for a street driven car. Well, be the sufficient. problem is the problem is that they blow out very quickly, even when you use bump stops. And that's that's my issue with KYB, KYBs, and they're also like super stiff sometimes. Like they were way too stiff for the Montero. Like they're just. Uh, I feel like I had them in my Montero too, didn't I? My Raider. Yeah, but there's not a lot of options, you yeah. know, or 
at least I found the Coney Heavy Tracks, which are better. Um, now, but and then a second gen, you can also find Bill Steins that will fit too. So. Right. But anyway, so I got. They're very cheap. Uh, Rock Auto sold uh, sets with came with a pair of struts and the top hats and the bellows boot and the bump stops for like you know one twenty five for front and rear. That's not bad at all. No, so I got those. Um, the only thing that's annoying is that the the front ones the only it only came with like even though it said top hats it came with like two rubber bushings. Because you got to re- reuse the front top hats because they they're not spherical bearings they don't turn right they don't really wear out so they don't really yeah it's not a McPherson strut and then the rears look like a McPherson strut they look exactly like a Subaru if you're familiar with the Subaru rear double rear trailing arms and it looks like a front strut but it actually goes in the rear that's exactly what it's set up like so did that then uh, I ordered some Tyne lowering springs which are like comfort lowering uh the so it's more of a like, so more of a style spring than a yeah, all-out performance spring. spring yeah they call it um yeah that's the other thing if you want to go like track days really i'm sure these springs are fine too for like autocross or something but oh i'm sure they are they're probably very similar to the the stock rates and just lower yeah i guess and um, it's, it's fine but anyway they're also really inexpensive they're like 180 bucks like that's like a no brainer. Like just so to replace almost every part in the suspension is like six hundred dollars. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, versus like a coilover system, we like double that for yep. a good one. For a for uh, a, a medium a mediocre one. <laughs> not even you get a set of feels or like sixteen hundred bucks. Okay, well, I suppose it's like three times. Yep. So anyway, um, yeah, it's like. I'll do that. They take an inch and a half out in the front and like a little less than an inch and a half in the rear. And uh, it's really what the car needs. Like it just needs to be lowered a little bit and some different wheels. Yeah, that's going to make a huge difference in the car. One inch larger, a one inch larger wheel and a slightly better stance. I think it will be transformed from like an old commuter car into an obvious enthusiast car. Yeah. And that's really all I intend to do with it and then just enjoy it. And it'll be cleaned up more, and we'll see what I do with it at the end of the summer. Yeah, I think buffing it up nice, cleaning it up nice, and maybe something that makes it a little more uh, aggressive feeling to drive. Like, do they make like a, a decent kind of an intake for it that sounds neat? No. No? Nope. That stinks. Nope. Because that would be neat to have like that induction sound, kind of like your old SI. Well, there's no like cam changeover or anything, so no. I mean, whatever cam changeover, just just the induction noise itself is, it, it's. I think it's better for a driver than a loud exhaust, you know, because you can hear it more when you're using the car. But yeah, so I got those, and then uh, I was looking for wheels, but I wanted, you know, I could go with the Inky ninety twos. I think we talked about this. Yep. Which are in the right fitment. They look pretty cool. I don't think they really fit the time frame for the car, though. Yeah, the aesthetic's a little different. Yeah, I feel like the mesh is a little more 80s on an Inky 92, even though you could get a mesh, like BBS basket weave, as an optional wheel for these. I think they're pretty timeless, to be honest with you, but I also understand why you wouldn't want to run them, because they're a common choice. Yeah, uh, it's because, rightfully and smartly, Inky reproduce their classic wheels in smaller sizes because people wanted that. Uh, if only we get tire manufacturers to follow suit. Right. Um, and the compies or comps, copies. I don't uh, say it. Comp or comp eight, a comp E. I don't remember. Anky, they're Anky wheel. They don't come quite in the right offset though, right? No, um, but they're that banana spoke. Um, the only thing I don't love about them is the extra little like diamonds on the edge. I can kind of live with it. So the reason for that is because it's part of their, originally it was part of their rally wheel lineup. Yeah. Um, and all their rally wheels have that extra little lip on the edge. And I think it's something to do with collecting dirt and mud. Okay. So okay. I think that's why that's there. So we've talked about in the past using Bayi 
as a like buying service for Yahoo auctions. Right, because Yahoo auctions won't proxy sell. Buyer. Yeah, they won't sell outside a country. So you need a, a proxy in Japan to 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 buy for you. And I had good luck getting JDM wheels for the Montero, not without spending a ton of money. Um, got some other stuff there. I feel like I think we've both bought a few set of wheels from them anyway. Yeah, I bought those split mode no wheels, um, which I'm not going to use because they don't fit. Um, decent price, but I was looking for front wheel drive Watanabe style wheels. Right. And a couple different companies make this style wheel that would still be a legit version. Um, and typically in the front wheel drive offsets, they're not very expensive because people want them for rear wheel drive cars. And I couldn't find anything on Bayi. I was looking around, looking around. I was talking to you about it. You found a set that was almost what I wanted on a site called Kruber. It's Kruber, yeah. Kruber? It's like four O's or something? I think it's only two O's, but yes. No, it's like three or four. It's like Kruber. Oh, is it really? Let's yeah. See. Oh, you're right. It's four O's. Yep. It's Kruber. Yeah. Kruber. Excellent. <laughs> uh, and they... Uh, I think they actually run Up Garage. Which, yeah, I think they're part of Up Garage somehow. I think it might be Up Garage's like online arm. It's basically. I know they tried to have a store in California, and it didn't work out well. And I think they're trying to come back, but it's basically they would like buy or salvage used JDM parts, and they document them really well, and take pictures of them, and get all the specs and post them, and then you just buy them. Like it's not an auction site. They just give you the price and a rating of the, uh, like the condition of it, and they give you a estimate on shipping. Um, and I found these. They only had like it was it was weird because they only had like two pictures, and I was like, oh, those look pretty good. Just from the two pictures, I was like, I'll I'll, I'll take a chance on because they were cheap. It was like uh, they're like two hundred fifty bucks. So uh, cheap. <laughs> so cheap. Four wheels. They're 15 by six and a half plus 40 offset. They're actually black racing. Yeah. Black racing comp is the name of the word. I didn't know the wheel. Yeah. So they're not technically Watanabe's, but they're basically Watanabe's. And they're not like replicas either. I think there's no. some kind of a licensing thing going on there, but I forget yeah. exactly what it is. Um, they're they're and- legit, legitimately like, they're not like a, like a knockoff wheel company from Korea. They're a made in Japan, um, actual, you know, qual- high quality wheel. It's just the same style as a Watanabe. Like I said, I think there's some some licensing thing going on there with between Watanabe and them. So, like I said, they only had like two pictures, but I was okay with it. I'll take a chance. I mean, it, that's not that much money. Shipping was like another two hundred fifty bucks, which for a wheel shipping from halfway around the planet via DHL, that's not bad. <clears throat> like, in the grand scheme of things. No, no. 500 bucks for a set of wheels? Come on. <laughs> I would have spent from... So, for a brand new set of Anki 92s, I would have spent almost $700 from Tire Rack. Yep. Just for example. So, uh, I buy them. Obviously, there's a time difference. Like, I don't know. Eight hours later, I get an email from some representative. Oh, sir, thank you for buying these. Um, uh, we realized there wasn't enough pictures. We've taken some more pictures of these, and they had an e- They had all these pictures in the email for me. I was like, "Oh, that's cool." So I looked at all the other pictures. It turns out they had center caps. Uh, awesome. Those weren't shown. Um, the scratches weren't didn't look really look that bad around the rim. Um, and it had like a little little bit of pitting, but they're just like a blackish gray color. It's like yeah, typical whatever. Watanabe style, not yeah. shiny finish. Um. I was like, all right, that's still fine. Please proceed with the order. You know, some hours go by. Okay, we'll ship them on April 5th. All right. It's now, they literally were recording this on April 7th. They came to my door at uh, noontime Eastern. So a day and a half. Overnight plus one from Japan. <laughs> I was like, what? Sec- second day air from Japan. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Um and looking at them, I only took one out. I mean, well, first of all, they were packed in like two nicely sized boxes, um, packed like 
with cardboard between them, bubble wrapped, foam, boxed up like they were old older wheel boxes. They got reused, so I took just the one out. I just happened to be the one that had the center caps in. Um, I'm looking at the one that I've taken out so far. The damage around the rim is like from dismounting a tire and it's not like curbing. It's like the paint is scratched. Like it just didn't stick to the aluminum. So it's almost like if I just clean these really nicely and kind of find like a flat blackish gray paint, I could just paint them and they would be fine. Touch them up. Um, and then I should have taken a picture of the inside. The inside is like no brake dust. Like they're not dirty. Like either they weren't used. Like there's not even like really corrosion on where they mount to the the hub. Like it's weird. Like there's they're like super super nice. Like so I can't they're believe it. Very well cleaned before they were shipped. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the hub bore is. I probably need centering rings because they look like they're like a seventy three. And okay. a Nissan will be a 60, it's like a 66.1 or something is what a Nissan is. It looks like, uh, to interrupt, Black Racing is a division of 5 Zegan. Oh, okay. So, that's, which is that's a, good brand. a legit company for sure. Yeah. I know they used to sell some Black Racing wheels here. Yeah, Tire okay. Rack actually stocked them for a little while. They didn't have yeah. the Watanabe style. They had a, a five-spoke style, I remember they sold for a while. I always wanted, is it the five Zegan, like FN FN O one R, FN O one R, yeah, yep. the five. It's like a five spoke bent spoke. Uh, they usually came in like a really wide wheel. They looked kind of like the to the generic wheel, the Rota P forty five, which is a yeah. cop- copy of the Nismo R thirty four Skyline wheel. Yeah. They look similar, a little, look. yeah, similar. But I remember seeing, I think somebody has them on a Talon or an Eclipse, and they're super old now because they would have had to buy them like ten or fifteen years ago. But they looked really cool, and they were like a very aggressive, like sixteen by eight or seventeen by eight. I think. Oh wait, no, the FNO, the FNOR is the thin five spoke. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was thinking of the That's wider. Five, I was thinking of the wider five spoke. No. I like these two though. Yeah. But well, they definitely very actually they would look good on the G20 too cuz it's a very 90s yeah style wheel without being an over the top 90s wheel. Yeah. Definitely fits. I still style. want I still want some TE37s. Um I put these Watanabe or well, these black racing wheels up against the Galant and I was like, "Yeah, they look pretty good." But they look better on the I think on the G20. Well, the good news is it's the same bolt pattern and you could probably switch yeah. them around if you wanted to. Yeah, I might throw them on there just to just to look at it, but yep. they're definitely going to the G twenty. I think, I think I would like to keep on the lookout for some used T thirty sevens for the Galant. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be a good a good upgrade for that car. Just to just to change it up. But yeah, anyway, um, I'd recommend Gruber if you're looking for used JDM parts. Yeah, there's there's less less stock than they obviously you can see at Yahoo Japan through buy e. Yeah. But it's because they have they sell what they have in stock. They're not an auction service. So they actually have warehouses full of this stuff over there. So that's part of the reason it's so quick too. It's not like you didn't buy them on Yahoo Japan from a private seller in Japan and have them shipped to buy e's warehouse and then ship from buy e's warehouse to you. It was direct from Kruber's warehouse in Japan to you. Which the other thing too, before I purchased them, they gave me the shipping estimate. When you buy from Bai, it's like yeah. they ship the stuff to the Bai warehouse, yep. and then they give you an estimate on shipping. So, like, I think I talked about it before. There was I wanted like I needed to get I needed five wheels for the Montero, so I had to buy two sets of four. Um, one set was very reasonable to ship for some reason, and the other set, even though it was the same exact wheels, was like astronomically expensive i don't know why just a different person priced them out for some reason um so i had to like just forfeit whatever i paid for those on buy which it wasn't much because they were just stock i I remember not caring too much i knew i I knew there was gonna be a risk to it i had they had to just quote unquote scrap them i'm sure they just get sold again on buy right yeah possibly um 
so then I ended up, I think, getting the the fifth one like off of eBay in in the states because that wheel was available uh, as like early second gens. Yeah, top top of the line early second gens. But it was easier to find four in Japan. So, yeah, I would uh, I definitely recommend checking them out, and I'll probably look there from other stuff. Yeah, there's some decent stuff on there. Even right now, I just looked. And I'm not going to buy anything, I don't think. But maybe I will. Who knows? <laughs> there's a set of legit Watanabe's on there, which are... Eh, I don't think that car needs Watanabe's, too. Anyway, moving on. No, but I they do have a nice uh, search interface for wheels. Yep. Yeah, you go like by size. And specs. So you, you, they break it down. You say you're looking for wheels, and you want a four-hole... So you want to buy it by size. So I want, you know, a 14 inch, 15 inch, how many holes? And then what's the um, spacing, the spacing. So 114.3. And then that, everything just comes up with exactly what they have in that sizes. And then you can give an offset range. You can. Yep. And you can sort from uh, new to and used. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Definitely a good site. And there's some interesting stuff on there for decent prices because, I mean, you get legit wheels for half the price of anything else. Like, there's no no reason not to. Yeah, and they might have some dings on them, but I don't know. I feel like sometimes with an old car, a little patina on the wheels is okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's an old car. Like, I may buy these XR4s before the night is over. <laughs> so, we'll have to see. Uh, they got a pretty good ding on them. Maybe not. Anyway. I'll send you the link later. All right. Because <laughs> they'd be perfect for my Toyota Cressida, which is on a truck in between Georgia and here. Um, and actually will be here about 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So by the time this when thing gets downloaded to listen to, the car will be here, supposedly. When was that picked up? Uh, Easter was Sunday, so Sunday. Wow. So Sunday at like 5 o'clock, they picked it up. And it was the second car in the truck. So I assumed it would be a bit before it got here um, because, you know, the truck was still pretty empty and they have a bunch of stops to make between Georgia and here. But uh, no, the car should be here at like 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. I was looking at the mileage between uh, Brainbridge, Georgia, where it is and here, and it's only a 26-hour drive. So it's actually yeah. not that far. You know, yeah. I think about driving cross-country. I think about driving from Boston to here where it's, you know, an additional 10 hours on top of that. No. So it's not uh, it's not too much too bad of a drive. So I guess it's not surprising that I could be here in four days. But I'm stoked. I'm super excited for the car to be here. You know, it's all set up in my insurance and everything already. So once it gets here, I can just take it for a ride and relive the old days of six years ago. <laughs> cool. So I'm I'm pretty excited. I can't wait till next week. I can give everybody a progress report on you know what the differences are in the car from when I got rid of it till now. Um, I want to take a look at all the suspension install because that was all changed from when I sold it till now. Yeah, make sure everything's you know up to snuff and done correctly. You know, I'm 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 both excited and nervous to see how the paint looks because I know it was painted in that time frame. Um, I'm excited and nervous to see the stereo in the car because something put a stereo in it, which makes me nervous all the time. So there could be some some things to fix. We'll have to see. But the last picture I got of the car where he had it sent me a picture of the car on the on the the transport truck, I noticed that it still had my Massachusetts inspection sticker on the windshield. Oh, weird. Yeah. And then he sent me a, a picture of everything that was in the trunk that he was sending back with the car. And it's all the stuff that I left in the trunk when I sold the car. No, weird. So like the owner's manual, the repair manuals, the California plate frames from where it was, um, the spare parts that I had, the extra oil that I had, like all the extra, the part, the tools that I left in there, everything is still in the car. So, yeah, it's quite strange. Yeah, it's going to be a weird time warp. But changed, because like I said, it's had the suspension installed. It's had a radio installed. And it's been painted. And the old 80s blue tint was taken out the windows. Uh, and it looks like it has kind of like a very light smoked tint to it now. So I'll have to see if that winds up getting changed or not. We'll see. I don't know. The picture you sent me, I thought it looked good. Yeah, I think it looks fine. But I'll, I'll know for sure when I see it in person. I mean, you're probably going to like it out there. I'm not a big fan of tint even out here. And now, you know, it's modern. I'm a modern. big fan of not getting skin cancer, so I like tint. 
Well, there's options now for a clear UV film, which I'm... I also don't like my face being burnt, so... But the clear UV film should help. So... Well, you need something just to cut the sun's rays down. That's why you wear sunglasses, like it's cooler. Sure, but the UV film will also help cut the sun's rays a little bit, will it not? No, because it doesn't cut the light intensity. It's The tint makes it darker in the car, so you're not getting as hot. Uh, we'll see what happens. I need to take a look at the car first and, and decide like, from there, but... Like all my all my cars are tinted except for like the Galant Talon and the G twenty. So like I go to drive it and I feel like I'm in a fishbowl. Like, I like how you say all my cars are tinted except for and you list off three cars. Well, all the like cars that. I normally drive like <laughs> all the time. Yeah, no, it's, it's just it's just funny to say that. Um, but uh, yeah, so that car is going to be here soon, and uh, I I hope to have a good report for everybody next week because if I don't, I'm going to be very upset. So I think it should be okay. I had a very long conversation with the person I bought the car from. and How was it painted? I have pictures of it in paint, so the whole car was taken apart. Okay. Um, right down, the doors are off, taillights are out, bumpers are off. Like, the whole car was stripped down to a rolling shell, pretty much, and repainted. Wow. So, um, I know that after it got painted, something not great happened to the right front door, and it was repainted, and it does not match the rest of the car. So the first thing that will happen is the right front door will be repainted again out here. I, uh, I think I already have a shop lined up to do it for me. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But after talking about it, they seem excited to do it. So hopefully we can uh, make something work and get it painted, you know, within a week or two of it being here. Cause I don't want to drive around with a mismatched door cause the car is too nice. Otherwise I think so right. we'll see how it actually looks, but be plenty of updates next week. I'm sure there'll be plenty of pictures posted between now and then, so stay tuned. Look out for those. Hmm. Um, project car updates. I worked on the stupid Volkswagen again. I know you're going to roll your eyes, but... Oh, was it that loud? Here's, here's where we're at. <laughs> um, the car's not going to run in my possession. It's just not. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've replaced everything on the car. Um, the last thing, which I never even checked in the beginning, was the fuel injectors, which I guess I probably should have. Because after doing all the work I've done to the car, the fuel injectors don't seem to be firing. Uh. There doesn't seem to be. So the way the modern fuel injector works after doing some research into it, it's supposed to have 12 volt constant power. And when they fire is they ground out. So the ground is what causes them to fire. So when you turn the ignition to on, the power to the fuel injector should be a constant 12 volts. So all of them have a constant 3.4. So I don't know why, but that's where I'm at. So yeah. we've replaced, again, the first thing that happened was the fuel pump was definitely bad. I replaced the fuel pump. And then it was kind of a, why are we not getting fuel? Replaced a fuel filter, replaced the, or worked on that stupid wiring issue I had to fix, um, cleaned up all the wiring, got it to a point where it made sense and everything worked the way it was supposed to. Um, we reset the ECU so that it relearned the uh, immobilizer. Um, make sure the immobilizer light goes out after, you know, five seconds of the car being on and the key ignition, which it does. So it should start, <laughs> but there's nothing, I, and it will run. It runs just fine on straight starting fluid. So the problem lies in getting the fuel from the fuel injectors. So at this point, the only thing it can be is an ECU. Um, so I was looking at grabbing a used ECU from the junkyard because it's pretty easy to get out. But it turns out that you can't just slap another ECU in the car without having the uh, the Vagcom tool. So I don't have access to a VAGCOM tool and I don't want to spend $200 in labor at a Volkswagen dealer to get this hunk of junk running. So. All right. So to be fair though, fuel injectors would have been like 10th on my list of things to check. So. They were about 10th on my list. Yeah. Cause that's like not a common thing that you would. And, and actually fuel injectors aren't broken. It's, it's something that between the, the signal to the fuel injectors isn't getting there. 
Yeah, so it's so, either a cam or a crank sensor. Cam, crank a- sensor, or ECU. And at this point, I just don't care enough to continue to to try. I mean, I guess if I came up with a cam sensor quickly, is maybe. Is it a distributor car, or is it a ignition coil? It's a coil car. Individual coil. That's a coil car, I think. Okay. I don't even know. I haven't even looked. I was going to say, because it's, if, it's, if it's got a distributor, it could be a bad distributor, because that's where your cam position sensor is. is. Yeah, I, I, without saying the right thing, I, I I do not know. I know it's not a it's not a coil on plug car like a like a one eighty Volkswagen is, but it could be a. I don't know. I I just don't know. I haven't looked into it enough. The car get the car makes sparks, so I didn't worry about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but um, that could be. That's where the the sensor is sometimes. No, and I agree. I just don't. I haven't gone down that road and now that the Toyota is getting here I just want this thing out of my driveway mm-hmm. because it's just one too many cars to have in the yard here without having the garage built so yeah. I just need to move it so we're building a uh, no, a garage obviously in the future but in the meantime we're doing um, a big thing out here is sunshades yeah. so we have an alley that goes between our house and a wall and the wall is probably I don't know I guess 8 feet high so we're attaching, we bought these like professional looking sunshades that are going to attach from the house and then stretch down to that wall. And then it'll be like a, a sunshade kind of shelter on the side of the house. The cars won't be in the sun. Yeah. So I'll probably wind up having the, you know, have the Eclipse parked out there under a cover with the Colt and then the Cressida can go in the garage because the trim on the Cressida is very expensive and hard to replace. So the Eclipse is a little more modern and a little more resilient to the sun. Um, and then with a proper cover and that proper shield until we get the garage built, it'll be fine. Yeah. So that's, that's the plan there. I'm trying to look up right now, the ignition system on this, this thing. Uh, it's, it's a coil. It has the coil with the four ports for the plug, for the plug wires. All right. So, so yeah, it's probably a crank sensor or cam sensor. It's just bad or broken. Yeah, let's see, a cam sensor. Uh, now you're making me think, because the cam is only $10. See, here I was all ready to give up. No. Are you tell me I still give up? <laughs> yeah. If it tries to be a cam sensor and it's $10, I'm going to kick myself. <laughs> Why? What's the difference going to be? $100 in the price of the car? No, it's a $500 car not running. It's a $1,500 car running. It's a $0 <laughs> car, actually, as it sits. <laughs> Is there is there both a cam and a crank sensor? Yeah, there is. The, the, the total price of two of them be twenty bucks. It depends on how hard they are to change. I'll take a look tonight. They are both one bolt style, so if they're not too deep in the car. Yeah, but the problem is if they're under like timing covers or. Yeah, well, I'll take a look. We'll see. I wonder if way I can test the ones in the car. There probably is. There's probably a uh, a resistance they're supposed to have. Yeah. Uh, maybe check that later. All right. Damn it, here I'm already give up, and you want me to give up, and now you have inadvertently talked me into trying one more thing. Even though my brain already thought cam sensor, I hadn't looked it up yet. So, Well, if we remember, that's what uh, broke on the Montero and made it what, not run. I do remember, yes. That was such a weird thing, bent. The funny thing is, is this car... The wheel shattered the cam sensor. It's like so strange. The funny thing is that the story with this car is this car was running. It's very low to the ground um, because it's a Mark IV and that's what Mark IVs are. They're all modified. Um, it's got full coils at it. And they, were, they were turned pretty pretty much all the way down and it hit a drainage like ditch in the road and it cracked the oil pan. Okay. Shut off immediately, rolled to the side of the road and towed home, put on jack stands, Change the oil pan. Then the, can, then the crank sensor's broke. That's probably the crank sensor, yeah. I can tell you right now, he broke the whoever did it broke the crank sensor. Or didn't plug it back in. Oh. All right, maybe I'll jack it up tomorrow. Because it's got to be on the end of the crank. One would assume. And, yeah. I mean, I don't know how the oil pan is on those. Like where it, but if it goes around the crank or yeah. crank goes through it like an oil case, uh, 
I wonder if that case. would, yeah, it would probably interrupt the signal to the injectors, right? Because it's, yeah. it doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know how to fire them because it doesn't know what. If the ECU doesn't know what cycle the engine is 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 in, it does not know when to fire the injectors. Hmm. All right, we'll take another look. See, you ruin it again. What are you What are you doing to me here, Andrew? <laughs> here I am, all excited about the crest is coming tomorrow. Now I got to work on the Volkswagen again. Uh, <laughs> I don't like this. I mean, I have a knowing thing that the I was changing over the uh, winter tires to summer tires for Stephanie's cross track, and it's an eighteen with thirty five thousand miles on it, and I think we've put. 1500 miles on it in the last year right um so it uh and she used to drive it every day on the highway but um i only recently turned off the hill hold i finally figured that out that i've complained about forever correct um which definitely uses the rear brakes and the calipers because the front brakes i just because the wheels are off i was like well i better check the pads fronts are like half worn all right, all right. That's as expected with a manual transmission car with only thirty five thousand miles on it. Yep. I go to the rear and they've got like two mil on them, like they're almost to the backing. That's interesting. Okay. So does it drag the brake when you come off the clutch? Yeah, it doesn't let go of the hill hold quick enough. Huh? Uh, like I can I can be releasing the clutch off the brake, trying to give it a little bit of throttle, and the it's like it's like you have the parking brake on, and then all of a sudden it. Let's go. So you're also like slipping the clutch more than you want to, too. Interesting. Super annoying and aggressive. And so I finally figured out how to shut it off. So now you just have to live with the stupid hill hold light on in the dash. Because it tells you that's off. Hmm. Interesting. Because my Volkswagen is not like that. The second I touch anything, it releases the brake. Yeah. So mine is like that, too. And it, it's, it stays on for like three seconds and then it'll let go. Like if you, so get on a little incline, come off the clutch and off the brake. Obviously, if like nobody's around. Also, you're going to have to find a hill in Phoenix. Um, <laughs> it's a couple of them. <laughs> it will, um, you'll feel it. It won't move. And then one, two, three, it'll let go. And you'll roll backwards, which is pretty common. That's usually the way they work. Yeah, that's how mine works too. It takes a little time to, to, to. It lets you sit there, and then it will release if you don't do anything. I know Stephanie was telling me she had figured out some like pedal sequence when driving, stop and go to like not get it to engage. So mine won't engage if I come to a stop and then come off the brake and on the brake real quick. It won't engage the hill hold. And then the crazy one I had was the the manual golf in Europe. You could literally sit on the hill with the hill hold on. It would put the brake lights on. That's interesting. I, I learned recently that a lot of these cars with the uh, automatic cruise control yeah. will apply the brake lights as well. Yeah, I bet. I bet when my uh, car does auto braking, it will. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize that because I was behind a guy um, on um, I seventeen through like the mountains here, and it was like he was constantly on the brakes. I was like, "What is this guy doing? He needs to get off the brakes." Um, but the whole time, it turned out that he had his because we, we were with them. We were going the same place, um, and it turned out that he had his auto cruise control on. And when it would go up a hill, it would be accelerating. It would crest the hill and come back down, and it would apply the brakes to keep the vehicle at the right speed. Huh. So I don't know if it applied the brakes or if it did it with, cause it's a Mazda with the CVT. So I don't know if it uses the transmission to slow it down or it actually does apply the brakes. If it actually does apply the brakes, that seems like an absolutely awful idea to run that kind of speed control on a mountain like that. <laughs> cause you yeah. think it would overheat the brakes and wear them out for sure. But it definitely applied the brake lights. And I was like talking to him about riding the brakes and he's like, no, I never touched the brakes. You know, I just have it on set it to 65 and go. I was like, interesting. So then when we had a rental Altima to go out to Oklahoma last, I think it was Thanksgiving, maybe. I don't remember when it was. Um, I noticed at nighttime that when I had the auto cruise control on, the 
the brake lights come on when it would slow down. So yeah, weird. Yeah. I, mean, I guess it makes sense. You need to let the heel behind you know what you're doing, but it was yeah. a little weird on the downhill on like I-17 because you didn't know when he was going to start to hit the brakes because the brake lights were just always on. <laughs> right. So it's not like they have like a, a, a potentiometer to make them brighter as you apply the brakes harder. It was just constant on brake light. Yeah. So. Yeah, that reminds me. Yeah, that the Golf had, had an electric parking brake. So you would, even though it was a manual, so you'd come up, you could shut the car off and they would go, and you could hear it. Yep. It would automatically set it. And then you could, or you could press the release. But the hill hold was cool because there was a lot of hills there. Right. So like I could like be waiting in traffic and just take my foot off the clutch, take my foot off the brake. And then as soon as you hit, put the, push the clutch in and went to give it throttle, it would, it would, yeah, you push the clutch in and then you would let off again and then it would release. It was, it was once you got used to it, it was very useful. Yeah, it's pretty good. Definitely different than the American style one. Yeah. I wonder why. But like I parallel parked on like like a 30 degree hill with it. No issue. Hmm. Be nice to have in like San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. It was a very steep hill. A very small spot. <laughs> Neat. What else is going on today, Andrew? Anything good? Um, you know what we didn't talk about last week was the Bristol in the dirt. Okay. Even though we're even though we're like a week late. It was awesome. It was pretty it was pretty cool. They announced they're doing it again next year. Yeah. Um, I think that it was funny watching the trucks try to do it because they tried to do it right after a rainstorm and they couldn't do yeah. anything. It was useless. <laughs> Two laps, red flag, because the windshields were covered in mud. So it has to be the right uh, moisture level, and then it will just be dusty. And then the weirdest thing is that the dirt actually takes rubber. Yeah, they were saying that because the way the tires spin on it, they they make the dirt firm, and then it's firm enough that as the tire is spinning, it actually transfers rubber from the tires onto the dirt. Yeah. Which is wild. Stephanie was like, oh, is the track wearing through? I'm like, no, 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 that's... I also, the, I mean, I'm sure they're like super soft, like gumdrop tires, but yeah, it was like laying rubber. You could see the groove. Yep. It was like a black spot. It looked like it was, they were through the dirt down on the pavement. I can see why she would think that. And, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say that. I didn't think that when I first saw it. <laughs> until yeah. they explained it. And then I didn't, I didn't realize until they, is it Larry McReynolds is the technical yeah. guy. Yep. Um, he was talking about the, they ran, those tires are bias plies. Which to me is crazy. Yeah. Well, they want them to have more flex to bite yeah. into the dirt in the rough track. And bias ply tires by design have a lot more flex in them. Yeah. I mean, people like, I don't think passionate guard tires have been bias ply since like the 60s. Uh, 70s, early 70s. Yeah. So I like the factory tires in my Camaro would have been bias plies. Yeah. Because that was like the big thing. You know, the BF Goodrich, the radial TA was the safety tire, right? Yep. It was like the performance safety tire. Have you ever tire. driven a car with bias plies on it? I have not. So what's weird about them is because they have a, I don't want to call it a softer construction because the rubber material is not that softer, but the, the steel belt inside the tire gives the tire its shape and it keeps it formed like a tire, whereas the bias plies don't have that. They're just rubber on rubber. So it follows every little crack and crown in the road so you're always constantly squirm. yeah you're constantly correcting the steering it doesn't just go straight it needs a little input all the time yeah weird so it's but it's more it's more compliant as far as you know forming to the road surface which is why the race car tires would be because that that track was if nothing else it was not smooth <laughs> Especially by the yeah. end of the race. It was a bit of a nightmare of, of speed bumps. You could see the way the cars were bouncing up and down the track. It should be interesting seeing it done next year when they're running that, uh, the, what are they calling the new car now? The next gen. Next gen, next gen NASCAR. And it's going to yeah. have like 17 or 18 inch I aluminum wheels. I don't know if that's 22 or 23. I, I feel like it is 2022. I think it's next year, yeah. Yeah, they're running center lock. Yeah, they're running center lock like 18 19 or 19 inch aluminum wheels. So yeah, they basically look like a sports car wheel from like IMSA. Yeah, so actually the whole car itself is like it's borderline like V8 supercar. Yeah. It's I'm um, I'm way into it. It's gonna, and I'm yeah. glad they're doing more road courses cuz Yeah, I think they went independent rear. 
Okay, that's cool. It looks like it because the when you look at the picture I sent you, like the rear camber, it's like aggressive. Right. So I think they went independent rear. Um, there was something else. I think that was the big thing. It was independent rear and center locks. Are they doing a sequential trans too? That's it. That's yeah, everything. That's what I thought. Yeah. So, but it should be interesting to see how that new chassis and suspension will be able to handle that kind of a bumpy track. Yeah. So I think it's, I think they're even six speeds. Awesome. They're finally into the, finally into the 21st century. Yeah. It's like 1990 over there at NASCAR. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely into it. I'm definitely into seeing it, but the, the dirt course was neat. They brought in like, I forget how many yards of dirt and how many truck worlds of dirt. Um, like a pretty heavy amount of dirt. So, and they ran other cars on it all week. So it wasn't like they did all this just for the cup race. I guess there were, you know, other, other NASCAR series running there the entire week. And then obviously the trucks were supposed to be Saturday and the cup cars are supposed to be Sunday, but it rained so much that it all got rained out till Monday. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a couple weeks before they did the outlaw modifieds or whatever they late model modifieds, whatever the hell it's called. I don't know. They're like wedge cars. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what they're called. Dirt track oval cars. Yeah. Saturday night special stock cars. But they ran all kinds of stuff there the, the weeks prior to it. So it was a uh, it was a really, really good, really good event. And it was good for the sport, I think, because a lot of people got brought back to it that didn't, you know, probably watch it for a long time. So I'd heard a few people say it was going to be a bad time. It wasn't going to be good. But, you know, they were definitely wrong. <laughs> it was It was a lot of fun. No, it's pretty good. So I, I can only imagine what it was like to be there and see it. You know, you probably went home covered in dirt, but you had a cool, a cool, a cool story behind it to see that first dirt track event oh, yeah, in fifty they, years. Yeah, they had people wearing safety glasses and like in the stands and masks. Oh wait, <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I would, I'd love to go see that in person. That'd be neat. So, and it was, it was cool because some of the drivers that they expected the the dirt track like ringers that they hired. They expected yeah. they would come in and they would be, you know, wiping the floor with everybody, but they didn't. The guys that were in the top five, most of them, a couple of them had never driven on dirt before that. So it was it was really neat to see. Well, I guess cup cars are just, they're heavy. So if you're not used to how heavy they are compared to like a, a dirt modified car. Yep. It's not the same. Yeah. And it wasn't like a crash fest either, which is what some people predicted that it would just be crashes the whole entire time. It was not much more than a, a regular cup event. The truck series race was a bit more of a bit disaster, but the, uh, the cup cars themselves weren't, weren't that many crashes. They basically come in in like tandem to the corners. It's pretty yeah. Cool. There was a lot of, a lot of tandem drifting going on. It was real fun. Thoroughly enjoyed. Oh yeah. Um, uh, one last piece of news. Uh, did you yeah. see the lime rock was sold? Was it sold? I I kind of just saw the headline. Yep. So it was sold to an enthusiast investor group. So it wasn't sold to like a developer. So that's good. Yeah. Um, it was sold to an enthusiast enthusiast investor group. There are three guys that have been. They all call it their second home, pretty much. I guess one guy is the former president of Airstream Trailers. Okay. Um, and they're all people that have been going to the track forever. So I guess the majority owner before was Skip Barber. Yes. Uh, and they're, they're keeping they're hard times, right? Yeah. But they're, they're still keeping, I guess, a, a vested interest. They're not going away. So the Skip Barber stuff will still happen there. Um, but they just sold a major controlling portion to this investor group. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like anything's going to change drastically. Um, their plans they're announcing so far are just to, to build on what's already there. They don't want to drastically change things. They just want to make it better, and they want to work better with the town, I guess. They need to do the Fenway Park model, where, remember in the 90s, that everybody was like, tear Fenway down. It's, it's trash. Yeah, right? yeah. Build, a, build a modern stadium. Right. And a, lot, and a lot of people were like, no, 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 save it, save it, save it. And the current owners of the Red Sox, I, I don't believe they owned it at the time they when they bought the Red Sox. They made a bunch of moves and basically got the park set up as a historical site. Yep. And once it's set up as a historical site, it, it has to stay, right? Yep. So they should probably do something like that with the, the racetrack and then basically just make improvements to it while still being a historical site, which is what 
they did to Fenway Park. So yeah, like, like you have to keep the character, but can make modern modernization. Yeah. So like, if you ever travel here and you want to see a baseball game, it's definitely worth going to Fenway Park because it's oh, a sure. cool old park. Yep. Um, and it looks way bigger on TV. Like, yeah, it definitely. Does. It's very small. <laughs> It's really small. Yeah. You yeah, remember it's in the middle of a city too. Like that's one of the yeah. cool things about Fenway Park. And there's, there's a couple others that are like that, but you know, people think about the New England Patriots. And if you're not from Massachusetts, you assume they play in Boston. You don't realize that their stadium is like 45 minutes outside of Boston because yeah. that's where it needs to be to have enough room for parking in a football stadium. Yeah. Fenway is, it is kind of an anomaly because it's in the heart of Boston. Like, you can you can walk there from most other tourist destinations in Boston. Like it's not very far, and there is no parking, and they just don't care. You just don't drive there. No. You, you, you take a train, you take a bus, you take an Uber. You don't you don't drive to Fenway. So, unless unless you're you know one of the elite few that can park under the stadium. <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of the idea that you need to find some way to make it so that nobody can ever destroy it. Yeah, that'd be nice. And uh, then you just make it better. Yeah, and I guess that's pretty much their plan. I don't know about the make it a historical society, but they definitely got to make it a uh, improvement on what's there and try to keep the general character of the place as is. So it's all it's all good news. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's anything to be scared about or any kind of uh, going away in any kind of future. So I know I was talking to a friend of the pod and listener Steve Booten about going to. There's Memorial Day races there that are pretty common. Yep. And uh, the historics. Kind of no. Oh, it's Labor Day. It's Labor Day. Sorry. Yeah. I'm still, still doing that. Get this again. Still doing that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, we might, uh, I might meet him there for Memorial Day because they don't race on Sundays. Right. But we could meet up Saturday. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. So, I'll let everybody know if there's anybody else local that wants to meet us there. Um, we could hang out, but um, that's the end of May. I guess the last, the last of May, right? Yep, last weekend of May. May. Mm-hmm. Cool, sweet. All right, what's well, all the news that's fit to print? Sure, vocally, vocally print. Yeah, anything else? Not, not today. Sounds good. So you can follow us on Out Off Topic Podcast on Facebook, Out Off Topic on Instagram. Out off topic on Twitter. Follow me, Race and Anger. I'm on Instagram. I'm also on Twitter if you want to follow me on there. And uh, Brad, where can they find you? They can find me on Instagram at TSISS350. Cool. As always, keep your cards analog and aim for the road. Yeah.